welcome everyone. This is a, a, a joint presentation from uh, University of New England students, but also in collaboration with BRAID, which is, uh, stands for the uh, Researchers in Agricultural for in International Development. Uh, the first thing I'll do before I start the formal presentations is acknowledgement of country while we're here. The University of New England, which where we presently stand, acknowledges and respects that its people, programs and facilities are built on land and surrounded by a sense of belonging, both ancient and contemporary, of the world's oldest living culture. In doing so, UNE values and respects Indigenous knowledge systems as a vital part of the knowledge capital of Australia. And that's quite fitting because today we have a collection of uh, four presentations, uh, some of those from recently graduated UNE PhD students, as well as a current PhD student, talking about their work, talking about their work, uh, some in some instances in the, the country they're from, um, and some instances in, in Australia. And these, these people have actually connected with the knowledge of the farmers, in most cases, and, and looking at how they're supporting agriculture in their region. So we, we actually, uh, one of the key things is valuing that knowledge and the connections to, to, their, to their experiential knowledge. So the projects that we're going to look at are from different parts, and I'll just move to that slide. Um, presentation slide. <laughs> this never works when you wanted to. <laughs> so the purpose really was to bring together these various projects from around the world in Australia, Vietnam and Ethiopia. And they're focusing on the ways to feed the world whilst reducing some of the problems we are having at the moment, like carbon emissions, restoring biodiversity and supporting the livelihoods of farmers in those regions. Um, Paul, Associate Prof Professor Paul Christensen will introduce uh, sort of an overview of what's happening in, in the regions and, and so on. And he's very experienced in farming uh, agricultural systems and has worked a lot in various countries uh, overseas like Vietnam and other places, Nepal and other areas like that. Then we'll be followed by Nurul Amin, and he'll be talking about his work in Australia, which is looking at the social ecological system dynamics of soil carbon management, which is a very topical issue because we're trying to figure out how we can support farmers in their quest to improve their soil carbon uh, levels, but also at the same time maintain uh, a vibrant uh, farming system. We'll be followed by Ha Hun, who will talk about her research, and she's finished last year, so she's now Dr. Ha Hun, um, and she's looking at the means and ways of connecting and retaining local soil knowledge of smallholder farmers in central Vietnam. And finally, we'll have Zalalem Lima, who will talk about his work in addressing the sustainable intensification of smallholder livestock systems in Ethiopia. So we have a a very wonderful list of presenters and they'll all present. And what I wanted to uh, request from you is that the presenters will present sequentially and then we'll leave time for questions at the end. So if you can actually uh, put your questions in the chat line, we have Yori Bremer here to, to collate those questions for each of the presenters. And at the end, we will um, go through those questions. So. We should have plenty of time to, to have those questions. And I think that's the purpose of today, is to actually encourage that interaction and that sharing of knowledge between early career researchers and current PhD students. Um, and so also, finally, I should just say thank you to, to the two the co-organisers, which is Yori Bremer and Zalala Lima, for working with RAID. Um, and their, their group of people to organise this event today. So I'll now move to the first speaker, which will be uh, Paul Christensen. Um, this never works when you want it to. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll leave it oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, folks. 
Thanks for um, the chance to come and talk. I was uh, been aware of RAID for a few years now, and I've been seeing them active in other universities. So it's really good for them to be active, or for the students here to be active in RAID and really starting to build links uh, with uh, amongst the students, uh, with staff and researchers in Australia, and building the bonds overseas as well. So I think it's it's really great to see this, and hopefully we'll have more. Um, I've just got one slide and I'm not, not even going to talk directly about it. It's really just sort of try to encapsulate. There's a lot of stuff going on. I noticed that the three talks are really all about people. So this, this uh, workshop's about the intersection of people, environment, and agriculture. Centrally, it's people, uh, we, you know, to get adoption. So we're very good at developing technologies in Australia. We've got good, you know, advanced science and so on. But how do you get it out there to the uh, communities that need this change? That's the big question. There's been a lot of uh, changes in paradigms around adoption and, and tech transfer over the years that sort of, you know, we can't be top down, we need to be bottom up and those sort of things. That's, that, even with that awareness, still we struggle to, you know, get adoption and so on. So it's a really big challenge. I think one of the things, you could be working in any, any of these areas, one of these specific areas, and then you're linking. I was going to try to draw a di links between all those for the three talks, but it got too complex in the end. I don't think, what, what part of this is neural doing? What part is hard doing around um, knowledge, indigenous knowledge and so on, and Zalalim? So it just gets too complex. But wherever you're working in that space, it's really important to be aware that you're working in that big picture. So you may be working on something specific around technology, precision agriculture is the big new one. It may be around breeding, it may be around uh, land management on sloping lands and so on. But you've got to be aware of all of these drivers and all of these impacts and how that all fits in if you're really going to start to make any, any change. So the things, so often the topic, this, this talk, uh, is uh, driven by climate change. And it's the big one, it's in the sort of the, um, and it will continue to be. But I sort of see when I travel in other countries and I'm working and reading about other countries, I see climate changes in a way, a lot of it's fairly predictable. We, we, we know that temperature's going up. Uh, we Rainfall, so rainfall may go up or down. Uh, the amount, the timing and so on may change. Um, extreme weather events. So there's, there's a, a moderate amount of predictability and it's also slow and ongoing and so we can probably adapt to it in many cases um, so i sort of don't find that climate change is, is the biggest threat when i look at things it's more about the social changes so i see communities changing and they're the really big ones so it's around um i sort of see a lot of these sort of things particularly things like migration and that whole area of demographic change um, I, when I, in, in Vietnam in particular, I travel a lot there and I go to rural areas and see the changing demographics there. And then I'll go to areas around Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City and the big industrial zones there. And you see two ends of that whole out migration and really the process of modernization that's changing what's happening back on the farm. So I always think in 10 years time, who will be left on the farm? Will it just be grandma and grandpa? All the young people have left for, to work in the, uh, in the shoe factories and shirt factories in the, um, in the peri-urban and urban areas. So, so really for me, it's a lot of issues around the social change. So if we're going to talk about adoption, adoption of technology, who's left to adopt it in 10 years time and what will the technologies be? And I think there, that's really rapid changing. So we're looking at tens of thousands of people moving out of rural villages into regional centres and then often ending up in, in the big cities. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's changing, you know, week by week, really, really big changes. That's got implications for, and it's been driven by income. People need steady income. Agricultural incomes are becoming, uh, being pushed down, down, down with globalisation, are becoming unreliable and so on. So, and it has really big impacts on things like family cohesion, and community structures back in the villages and communities where these people are leaving. Uh, so I think that, that sort of demographic change to me is right up there with uh, climate change as a, as a key driver and something to consider and, and um, incorporate into thinking and that we need to understand. Uh, the sort of the second big area is really about this, I mean, supermarkets is, is one thing, but specialisation, I think somewhere I've got 
mechanisation. So who is on the farm is changing, but the way we farm is changing too. Well, the, the, the sort of the, the business structure is changing a lot too. So we not just uh, have a lot of small farmers and they're dealing with some, uh, maybe a long chain of traders or a short, short value chain of traders. And so on, that's all changing too. So now we're getting specialisation. So it may be not enough to earn money out of farming. Um, with more mechanisation, you can buy a bit of machinery and become a contractor. So we're seeing people, a farmer might have gone out and bought a harvester and they'll go and do contracting work. Um, so uh, the, the bigger role of agribusiness as well, um, so in terms of input supplies. So a, a farming family may actually set up a little shop and they may sell agricultural inputs, fertilizers, sprays, and things like that, or they may set up uh, pumping, irrigation technology. So, so people moving out of farming, not necessarily moving to the city to work in the big factories, but sort of spreading through the agricultural value chain for inputs, and then downstream in terms of processing, so taking local products, trying to value out those. So that's at a small scale, that sort of diversification you're also getting the big players coming in. So where I travel around, um, it's moving from smallholder family farms to slightly bigger corporate farms. And we've seen that in the West, we've seen that whole trajectory of kind of moving away from family farm to corporate farms. It's presumably gonna happen at various speeds uh, in, in just about all countries. That's the way it'll work. So we can see these big companies big national companies that might have been in petroleum or construction, they're investing in agriculture. So they're getting into, they've got into protected cultivation, things like glass houses and so on. Um, or they're coming in and setting up processing operations. So canneries, juicing, some sort of um, turning local produce into another product. So uh, I went to, I've been to one vegetable processing place. I've been to a couple one in Thailand and Vietnam and you go in and there's hundreds of usually women working in there. They've got their hair nets and, um, and they're chopping up veggies or, or washing <coughs> veggies into freezer bags and that's getting exported to, to North America and Europe and so on. So presumably 10 years ago, maybe a lot of those women were working on farms maybe growing vegetables or growing small scale crops, fruit and um, specialty crops. Now they're working in factories. And you sort of, I sort of think that uh, uh, getting jobs in rural areas is really important. It's to keep those families together, to try to address this sort of family cohesion and local community cohesion. Um, so for me, when we think about agriculture and a lot of it's about how do we keep uh, farming families going? How do we prop it up and do, do, is that what we want to do? do? Is it better to support people to move out of agriculture into other fields that have more reliable, reliable incomes or do we support them to keep going in what might be a, a very difficult enterprise? I, I think there's not a simple answer to that, but if we look at the, uh, you know, the global numbers over time, the proportion of agricultural or the proportion of the population working in agriculture goes down from 40%, 20%, 10%, and down to very low numbers. So trying to prevent that as countries modernise is um, possibly, um, you know, not, not very fruitful, but thinking how can we get structural adjustment in rural areas that keeps people there and that provides sort of diverse opportunities. I think mean, that's, that's the real challenge for me. So I sort of see through climate change, the demographic changes, and then really this whole uh, agribusiness change. I didn't mention supermarkets, so that's the other side too, is where we're selling now. So uh, before growers might have sold to local wet markets, the local traditional market, uh, that's becoming less and less common, more towards little specialty shops, supermarkets and exports. So even who, who agricultural producers are selling to is changing. So that whole agribusiness change is really important. So they're the sort of three areas that I think are are really challenging and um, and probably climate change is probably of those maybe the most predictable um, and the other two that sort of demographic change and agribusiness structural change are, are really really big and we need to be aware of those as we um, try to deal with um, adoption and, and changing communities so I think yeah just being aware of this big picture um, is very important yeah like I said wherever you fit within that 
um, be, always being aware of your little path through there. So that's the whole to the whole context uh, and knowing, okay, I'm trying to address this, maybe a technological need or um, a community development need, but what, what other things are affecting that? Because everything um, is interrelated after all. So I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll have our next speaker now. Um, Nauru. Oh, gone the wrong way. <laughs> okay, welcome, Nauru. Yep, that's it. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a, after a long time presenting <laughs> uh, because of the COVID. Yeah. So I'm very happy because uh, all of the presenters are. Uh, already have the PhD and professors, but I'm a PhD student. So I'm going to talk about my research, which is about the untangling the social ecological dynamics of soil carbon management in the grazing lands of Australia. So I'm Nurul Amin, you all know, and uh, uh, all PhD students have supervisor. In my case, I have four supervisors. So three is from University of New England and one is from University of Glasgow in Scotland. Before going to my full topic, I would like to introduce why soil carbon management is considered in my study. So actually uh, soil carbon influences atmospheric carbon and uh, agricultural carbon pool work as a sink for GHG mitigation. And uh, soil carbon is important for uh, soil condition indicators and soil carbon management provide different type of co-benefits. For example, it improves the soil health and uh, farm productivity. Maybe it will also improve the soil moisture condition. Sometimes it also improves mental health of the farmers. So why I'm considering the social ecological system framework in my soil carbon management? The so soil carbon management considered uh, both the social aspect and ecological aspect. For example, uh, the social aspect of social features could be the attitude of the farmers to change their practices, and it could be the farm size, it could be farmer demographics. And ecological features in a broad sense could be the climate change and soil properties. So in our first step, we examine what is known about the balance between the social and ecological features in the scientific uh, studies. So we did it as a first attempt to, to see what is the need of the social ecological system framework for soil carbon management. So what we have found that a uh, uh, number of scientific pub publication, uh, actually we focus in Australia, uh, increases after 2011, which is after introducing the carbon farming initiative by the Australian government and it has got a de decreasing trend after 2013 elections. And uh, another thing is, uh, important thing is, uh, most of the scientific studies is dominated by scientist and ecological perspective. So it's scientific focus and more ecological focused. So it has less farmer involvement. But as you have seen before, the soil carbon management is mainly the combination of both the social and, and ecological aspects. So we proposed a very simple framework, which is influenced by Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, we showed that the uh, social, uh, uh, I mean, the soil carbon management has three, I mean, three components, which is social, ecological, and uh, another is combination of social and ecological together. So ecological components are climate, soil properties and soil biodiversity in a broad sense. These are the key components, we think, and we can get it from, from the literature. And the uh, social components are governance and policy, carbon markets, society and culture. And uh, as you can see that uh, when we combine together, it would be the land use, because it, uh, then we have both the ecological aspect and social aspect, we have the ecosystem benefit, because ecosystem benefit could be the soil moisture content, uh, which is the outcome of the soil carbon management. It could be the mental health of the farmer. So we have social and ecological together. So this is our very simplistic framework, uh, we, we, which proposed for the soil carbon management in Australia. 
So uh, as, we am, as I'm talking about the uh, Ostrom framework, maybe many of you know about Ostrom framework. Ostrom framework comprises the uh, uh, social and ecological complex relationship in a very simplistic way. So it has four uh, com main component uh, and four main category, which is like resource system, resource unit, governance system, and users. So all these four components interact together and uh, it gives us outcome. So all of the dimensions of the uh, environment has this kind of these components in it, and they interact together to give us the uh, output. So our simple, our methodology was very simple. So we did uh, interviews. It is 25 interviews. It was 25 interviews. Uh, in our interviews was a uh, semi-structured questionnaire interview, uh, and interview was uh, our inter questionnaire was influenced by Ostrom's framework. And uh, we get the features from the interview. So first we did the NVIV coding and uh, we did uh, network analysis. So it's just converting the qualitative information into quantitative information. And then we did a net network analysis using the iGraph function of uh, RStudio. Uh, after that, we conceptualize the relationship among the features, uh, and that is the interconnectivity among the features from this network. So we, we did, uh, did a simple causal map from this network analysis. So the, the features we get from the interviews, we take, a, take it, in, it into the workshop, and we did four workshops, two with the farmers group and two with the service provider group. And with this, uh, within this workshop, uh, we let the farmer to conceptualize more features. So they conceptualized more features and they added more features, which is uh, uh, which was not from the interviews actually. And then uh, they conceptualize, I mean, they, they conceptualize the relationship among the features according to their practical experience. So finally, we synthesize these four uh, workshop output and we get our uh, social ecological system relationship for soil carbon management in this grazing system. So our study area is, uh, as, I, as I have said, that a uh, high rainfall grazing, grazing region of Northern Tablelands. I took one farm from the uh, Noun Dock, which is also kind of very close to Northern Tablelands. So I would say it's a, it's a kind of Northern Tableland. So I always like to say that I travel distance like more than 7,000 kilometers for collecting this information. So uh, 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 this is the, my study area, which is the high rainfall grazing, grazing region in uh, New South Wales. Uh, this is our network diagram. It, it is produced by iGraph. So uh, our network analysis showed that which features are important in, uh, from farmers' point of view and which, is, which features are less important and how these features are connected and what is the total connectivity of the features according to, uh, according to the farmer's point of view. So we found that the highest connected features are soil carbon management practice, training and education, uh, feature, education support, and farmers' uh, soil carbon management co-benefits. And lowest connected features is government organization and support. And the density of the connections among these features is only 30%, which is uh, very, very low. I will show it uh, the, um, the more explanation in the next slides. So this is the uh, causal loop map, which we extracted from the uh, network analysis. So you can see over here, the government aspect, soil carbon policy, whatever the uh, emission reduction fund or the uh, climate solution fund and the carbon pricing and monitoring is weakly connected with the soil carbon management practice. And the farmers uh, perceived important factor that is co-benefits is very, uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, not connected with the government aspects. And another important feature, uh, uh, which is the training and education support uh, and the social network, which, which is also not connected with, directly connected with the uh, government features or the soil carbon management policy. So this is the output uh, from our uh, workshop. So we uh, consolidated the four workshop output 
and we put it into the Stella program, I mean, system dynamic model modeling program. And uh, we found that our kind of same uh, uh, interactions and interconnectedness. So if you see over here, the uh, training and education support is not connected with the government organization, non-government organization that is the not of the governance system, which is a very important factor according to the farmer's perspective. And uh, again, uh, the uh, soil carbon management and soil carbon policy is uh, negatively connected in the system, according to the farmer and service provider point of view. So this is the picture of the uh, current uh, soil carbon management initiative taken by the uh, government. And uh, another thing is also uh, the uh, co-benefit, which is very important factor, which is also already included in the Climate uh, Solution Fund to 2019, but it is not directly connected with the soil carbon management policy uh, uh, from the point of view of the participant in my workshop. So uh, overall, the influential features are not connected to the policy, and we identified 10 critical loops uh, which is the balancing loop and reinforcing loops. So the balancing loop, idea of balancing loop is uh, the loops which is uh, influencing the negative outcome and making it into the positive outcome. And the balance, uh, reinforcing loop is the making the positive features, uh, reinforcing the positive features into the more positivity. Uh, so the usefulness of our SES approach is we uh, identified four, five broad themes that is co-benefit, training and education, and farmer social network, and inclusion of uh, pluralistic values, and connectedness of the uh, uh, feedback loops of, of the soil carbon management, which is uh, not really uh, uh, kind of overlooked in the current uh, policy system. And farmers believed important features are uh, actually not adequately included in the ERF and the potential feedback loops identified uh, actually can help the policymaker to improve the policy. So it's like uh, uh, considering the whole system, if we consider the one loop, and if we don't consider the an another loop, there will be uh, the chance of uh, uh, getting the source as, as a sink, a sink as a source. So, uh, so, so uh, the, the th thing is, the uh, idea is, we are uh, proposing that when considering the soil carbon management policy, we have to uh, uh, consider the whole uh, system of the soil carbon management, whole uh, package of the soil carbon management. And, and it will help uh, both farmers to identify co-benefits of soil carbon management and go government uh, goal of improvement of the soil carbon sequestration to offset greenhouse gas and to uh, get the net zero goal. And I think, uh, we think our novel is, very, our uh, methodology is very noble and we did it as a first attempt and it is useful for the similar data poor region of the world. So I always acknowledge uh, Southern New England land, land Care and New England Local Land Services for their uh, help throughout this ESS process. And uh, thank you all for passion sharing. Thank you very much. And I think Narul did very well because when he was interviewing his farmers, he was also interviewing at a time of drought and um, bushfires. So it was quite a quite a, a lengthy process, but it was worth it. I think you can see. So our next speaker um, is uh, Hahun, and she'll be presenting on means and ways of connecting and retaining local soil knowledge of smallholder farmers in central Vietnam. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the chance for me talking today. So um, today I would like to share with you um, uh, one part of my PhD uh, research uh, completed uh, last year. And uh, this is focused on means and ways of connecting and retaining local journalists of smallholder farmers in central of Vietnam. And uh, let's start with the presentation outline. Uh, first, I will, I will 
uh, talk a little bit about brief description of the local uh, of the study area and highlight of the study of literature review some uh, and uh, brief research uh, objective and mentors and research finding then there's some suggestion and summary uh, this study was conducted in two communes of uh, central of Vietnam, and this commune is belong to the uh, Batma National Park. is one of the highest uh, biodiversity uh, uh, conservation priority uh, in areas in Vietnam. And there are just some few mainstream time in this area is uh, a uh, red yellow ferrolite, a light yellow ferrolite, and alluvial soil and the, the main soil type is can call like a acre soils. Um, I want to share some highlights of uh, my study uh, literature review. Um, in uh, uh, many study like uh, talk about like a local soil knowledge and now it uh, has been uh, broadly recognized for its important and contribution to the sustainability of soil management in farming. Uh, and uh, in developing country, including Vietnam, like uh, the there is a threat to the retention of local soil knowledge uh, because of aging population and less interest of younger generation in farming, uh, and also supporting farmers in mountainous area uh, uh, to achieve the sustainable agriculture and less in uh, less uh, reliant economic of local people on the natural resources forest um, uh, resources um, now like a predominantly relied on the agricultural extension or co-management or the beneficiary mechanism uh, that's the reason why like uh, the farmer lsk uh, is the local soil knowledge uh, needs to be involved in implementing uh, sustainable soil uh, and natural resources management and um, in our uh, uh, local soil knowledge critical review paper published in 2020 uh, indicated that the conventional approach used in many LSK studies often involves farmers uh, cooperating uh, scientific soil uh, assessment rather than like uh, having them uh, their knowledge involved in initiating the in the sample size and contrasting to the conventional top-down approach of information flow from scientists to extension agents then to farmers there is ground wells of support for farmer first research and in this study, visual soil assessment is considered as a sympathetic uh, the scientific soil assessment to local practice and farmer LSK uh, because it's also less uh, qualitative and based on more observable soil uh, property. Uh, uh, from the result of the, our household survey in 2018, uh, we indicate uh, like uh, we found that like uh, the LSK is really important for for farmers and is really need to, for practical approaches for the uh, exchange knowledge and uh, maintaining the farmer first uh, philosophy. The study apply the key informant interview, visual soil assessment, and farmer workshop as strategy to engage and communicate, preserve farmer soil knowledge. Uh, 24 farmers with reasonable uh, um, and comprehensive LSK from uh, the survey in 2018 uh, were selected for the visa soil assessment and farmer workshop in 19, uh, 2019. After the, here, the, the interview with each farmer, the farmer was asked to choose the uh, the, the field for visual soil assessment and uh, they also uh, rank it their soil, uh, soil quality first, good, poor or moderate soil. And this is the 24 field size uh, uh, catch up by the GPS location uh, here the Google Earth. And uh, for the visual soil assessment, like uh, we dug the hole 200 and 200 millimeters 
square by 300 millimeter um, deep hole. Uh, and then the farmer and the scientist, with, uh, scientist work uh, systematically and independently <coughs> through the scorecard. Uh, and from the early uh, research, uh, finding of the interview and visual soil assessment, two farmer workshops were held, uh, were held uh, uh, via four activity. Uh, the first is define the soil types on some maps and receiving discussion. Uh, then the second one is uh, receiving dis discussing result of visual soil assessment and farmer ranking for their soil. The third one is the examined photo taken from different fields and then like verifying some native plants indicator. This is the scorecard of the FAO 2008. And uh, uh, here we just uh, show the, the figure one, like uh, the, work free, uh, the word frequency, analyze it in the NVivo trail plus the, to uh, collect like uh, the answer from farmer about they describe their soil property. And it's easy to see like uh, the color uh, either the most thin like a farmer mentioned about about soil, uh, about their soil. Uh, normally the darker and the blacker soil is uh, the, the rank for the wood soil and the lighter, the yellow and the, uh, the, the lighter one is the pale one like a, uh, a caressed by um, associated with the poor soil. And uh, one bit different, like uh, between poor soil and, and wood soil, that's farmer uh, do. Uh, that's either earthworm and earthworm and the moisture uh, can be like uh, uh, their, their main thing, like uh, to recognize the wood soil. And uh, different, like uh, the stone and sloping is for the poor soil. And uh, here is the resource finding from the visual soil assessment. Uh, the table one like indicate that before conducting the visual soil uh, assessment, the farmers, the uh, pre-assessment soil quality is uh, similar, quite similar to their visual soil assessment and uh, nearly two and a third uh, case. And uh, while remainder pre uh, pre uh, perceived their soil quality quite lower than visual soil assessment. Uh, this is maybe be called like uh, their long term experience in the forest and 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 that area uh, compared to the scientist people um, and uh, also there is no different we find out no different important uh, different like recorded between farmer and scientific uh, uh, visual soil assessment um, and uh, just one or two points like a different. And uh, also the research for findings from visual soil assessment via the PCA. Uh, the PCA1 and PCA2 was derived, uh, derived from like a 10 characteristic of soil indicators and uh, for determining the visual soil assessment star, uh, score. And uh, in which we found like five variable stars contribute most to the variation. Uh, that's in routine depth. Uh, soil erosion, soil color, and number of, and, and color of soil motors and surface ponding. Uh, and the last re research finding is uh, from farmer workshop. Activity one, we, uh, we, we, found one, we found that like more participants were able to share their soil knowledge uh, about the local, uh, the location of soil types using the maps. And farmers could share the, their soil knowledge with each other very confidently. And this observation like uh, made useful in further research in the remote area, like uh, this, uh, like a uh, Namdong district area, where the farm scale soil classification maps do not exist. Uh, the activity two uh, uh, is a uh, it's quite interesting because uh, this activity is uh, enable participant to review the data, uh, uh, data analysis, like the early data analysis from the key informant and the visual assessment, which uh, normally had not been the common occurrence in previous uh, uh, projects. 
And the, uh, this is the activity tree, like uh, we give the, the, the farmer, like uh, some picture we take from the, the field or the, some farms. Uh, so have the different the score and like uh, we discussed about like uh, uh, the role of the soil management and some and some soil problem uh, in, in, in the areas. And, uh, and this is like uh, can raise awareness the farmer more awareness about the soil problem and the sustainable practice. And last activity of the workshop like a uh, uh, the very fine native plants like uh, can can help the scientists collect like a uh, uh, the number of native plant indicator for soil quality and here we found out like a one from one to nine is uh, the the native plant like uh, the signal for uh, for the indicator for the good soil and from 10 to 19 is for poor soil and and from this, we also uh, can improve the soil assessment tool, such as like a visual soil assessment, like uh, the modified visual soil assessment uh, scorecard is still more suitable to the local area. And uh, some, some area like have the same condition, every environmental condition. And last is the proposal for mechanism for integration of local scientific uh, soil knowledge to improve sustainable uh, agriculture and soil use management through multi-level go uh, go uh, soil governance system uh, in Vietnam. And this is uh, using the current the soil governance. And uh, we, uh, we hope that the uh, conducted uh, like uh, the step, uh, this step like uh, our research like uh, for apply for the Soil, go soil governance like can help like a, a farmer to overcome the short term of economic uh, constraints and gain the advantages uh, of long term improvement in soil quality with support from other stakeholders, especially local government. And uh, that's it, uh, my, my presentation. And just here is just some, some highlights for my my uh, my presentation uh, uh, summary and uh, uh, incorporating LSK into research can improve uh, use of soil of uh, uh, soil assessment uh, and preserve LSK and provide guidance for sustainable soil use and measurement as well as the goal soil governance uh, and here's just some photo of this soil assessment and farmer workshop activities thank you for your attention yeah. Thanks, Ha. That was lovely. And I was, as you can see, I was there for some of that field work, which was really enjoyable part of uh, supervision of my PhD students to be able to travel to Vietnam and pre-COVID, obviously. <laughs> uh, so now we have our final speaker. Very welcome uh, to Zalalam Lima, who is going to present next. Um, oh, wrong way. <laughs> Um, and look, he's going to look at addressing barriers to sustainable smallholder livestock development in Ethiopia, the role of multi-level innovation platforms. So welcome, Zalam. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, attending this. And I would like to take uh, this opportunity uh, first to introduce myself. My name is Zalalim Lama, and I am Jody is trying to uh, regionally represent in Armidal about the rate network that we are working. So you can uh, register online, uh, like to be a member of the network. And then uh, it's all about uh, connecting and engaging and supporting young and uh, middle care researchers to really uh, be part of the international cultural research development and uh, contribute uh, to our food system. The other is, uh, yeah, when it comes to my topic, I'm going to take you to Ethiopia, uh, to Africa, uh, because the experience that we had is from Australia and Asia. And specifically, I'm interested to talk about the livestock uh, smallholder development uh, that's happening in Ethiopia. So I will have three main uh, topics I'm going to talk. One is, uh, as our topic of event today, we are celebrating the Earth Day uh, or Earth Month event uh, as part of the raid. And so I'm going to talk about the intersect of livestock, uh, people and the environment, uh, background. And so I will come to my case study, which uh, is part of my PhD. And I was trying to evaluate the effectiveness of 
multi-level innovation platforms in addressing the complex livestock system issues uh, in Ethiopia and Highlands. And the other is I'm going to give some uh, information about the ways to support farmers to or to make these innovation platforms effective in supporting uh, livestock holders. So livestock systems and, and people uh, in Ethiopia, agriculture is the con like contribute 83 percent of the total export and employs 80 percent of the population of 100 million plus currently and ethiopia has also Af africa's largest livestock population for example if you see the the cattle they uh, we have around 60 million cattle followed by tanzania in africa uh, which has uh, 33 million cattle so these numbers have an effect in terms of climate change perspective uh, because and also many, many farmers, especially the rural poor, like 80% of the rural poor farmers are depending on uh, livestock. So for, for their livelihoods. Uh, but the problem is farmers are still facing complex challenges, uh, socio-technical socio institutional barriers to increase livestock productivity and access markets. Uh, so livestock system in the environment. So a growing sector, uh, because there is an, an increasing population, uh, income is booming and also urbanization is, as uh, Paul was trying to give us uh, this morning, how this migration to urbanization has increased demand for livestock products. That means it requires more land, water and biomass to, to address this demand from the livestock perspective. The other is producing with high environmental costs. So currently the productivity of uh, African in general, uh, livestock productivity is very low. And uh, this is making it Sub-Saharan Africa a global spot for uh, greenhouse gas emission that's coming from livestock. The sector at the same time provides the highest potential for mitigating climate change uh, because the higher the productivity as we work to increase the productivity of the livestock, it means we can uh, lower the emission uh, from the livestock. Uh, so environmental inefficiency and the need to improve farmers' livelihood, these two are triggering uh, development agencies, uh, government and others to focus on productivity and market oriented production system for the smallholders. So when, when it comes to my case study, I was trying to look at how the different approaches we are using to develop innovations that can support smallholder farmers be effective. And one of the increasingly used approaches called innovation platforms. And uh, I used a case study from uh, a CGR system called International Livestock Research Institute that was implementing innovation platforms between 2012 and 2016. So what we did was we tried to engage all the, uh, the innovation platform members uh, to give us their perspectives and knowledge about how effective this approach has been in terms of addressing the complex livestock issues in the Ethiopian context. So innovation platforms uh, we studied are a kind of multi-level governance. Uh, the innovation platform that has been established at community level are at Kavali level, uh, which is uh, equivalent to community neighbors. So we studied four uh, Kavalis and as, at the same time, which are connected in district level, which we call it in Ethiopia, Warada. So we have Lim Warada and Basona Warada uh, innovation platforms, and they are also con connected to the, the national IP, which overlooks uh, mostly the, the district level innovation platforms and trying to work across. Uh, so these innovation platforms have been established to uh, focus on crop livestock system intensification. But our specific interest is to look at how these innovation platforms have supported the livestock systems. So we, we, we use a research methods, mostly qualitative approach. And we have um, collected data from uh, 48 key informant interviews, 23 of which are farmers themselves who have been adopting the livestock technologies that was initiated by the innovation platform. And we held also focus group discussions with uh, community level, district level and national level innovation platforms. So we used in vivo software uh, to code and manage our data and also do some qualitative analysis uh, using thematic approach. So I'm not going to go into detail about the research methods as uh, there is some published work uh, you can access for further information. And jumping to my findings, uh, so this is the five years activity we try to map uh, using a timeline. So the innovation platform started with diagnosing what farmers are facing in terms of livestock issues. So they have identified various 
socioeconomic and technical and institutional barriers, including uh, feed, feed, feed shortage, uh, as well as also access to inputs and services. As Paul was mentioning that it's not about only farm level technologies that farmers are facing, but access to services and inputs are the main uh, issues uh, across the value chain. So uh, this is the inception phase, which started in 2012 up to 2014. So in this activity, the innovation platforms have been established and they try to identify and uh, undertake some diagnostic activities, including uh, surveys and in interviewing farmers. And they identified uh, a list of livestock issues that farmers have facing. And from that, the next step was prioritizing which issue they, want, they, they are going to tackle through the innovation platforms. And at that time, the national IP decided that from all the problems identified, feed and forage was a cross-cutting issue. And they, they wanted to focus and address that issue uh, from the, and then they implemented and tested different uh, technologies. So this is from 2014 to 2016. There were a lot of uh, activities that uh, they tried to test technologies on farmers field and evaluate them and so try to scale up the technologies to other farmers. So these are, as a glance, like around nine or 10 technologies that has been introduced to farmers. And the first three focus on reducing feed losses, uh, like there was a, a lot of short loss, losses so that they want to conserve that because there was a feed scarcity and they want the technologies that can save that, uh, that, min that minimize the losses. And the other one is increasing feed availability, especially the quality and nutritious uh, forages. So for example, this is the, the first technology they introduced. Farmers usually try to uh, store the crop residue and uh, other feeds uh, like outdoor and it's exposed to sun and uh, rain and most of, most of the, 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 the feed resources are lost. And but they introduce a kind of rest bed uh, feed storage and farmers are going to store it. And so that, that will also keep the quality of the feed uh, increase, to increase the productivity of the, the livestock. The second one is the feed trough they introduced. It's a bit expensive for smallholder farmers, but uh, farmers usually try to give them like this in the, in the left side, but the, the one that the innovation platform try to introduce is on the right side. Um, these are also the different kind of uh, cultivated forages they introduced. And at the same time, we, in Ethiopian highlands, we have uh, like plateaus like this, where soil erosion is one of the main problems. So they try to integrate uh, tree lucerne to plant around the soil bands and so that it can conserve uh, the soil erosion. At the same time, farmers can get some biomass to feed their livestock. And this one is also autophage mixture. It's very uh, highly nutritive value. So as you can see, they, they plant this uh, on their farmlands by like letting go, for example, if they were producing wheat, they have to reallocate the land to produce the livestock feed. So it's a kind of big shift for farmers from uh, not like traditional feeding system to a kind of improved feeding system. So what we used to analyze our um, data was we used an innovation systems functions. So these are the, mostly we found from the literature that five functions that need to be fulfilled to make the innovations more effective in terms of socioeconomic, technical, as well as also institutional. So the first one is uh, demand articulation. So the question is, are farmers have been engaged? Uh, are their interests have been included in the innovation development? And also the, the demands of other actors, like not only researchers, but also government and NGOs who are working in the system. The second one is knowledge development and diffusion. So these are the technologies we have seen, how they have been developed, and also how they have been diffused to the farmers. And the institutional support uh, that the innovation platform is expected to, uh, to support is like providing also services and inputs for farmers in terms of forage, seeds, access, or uh, access to veterinary uh, for their livestock, or also access to breeding services for farmers to increase the productivity of their livestock. Uh, the fourth one is resource mobilization. So it's not only within the innovation platform, people are coming together, not only to share knowledge in, in a co-production system, but also to share resources so that they can support and improve the, the system, how it functions well. 
And the, fi the, fi the fifth one is agribusiness development. Uh, as Paul was mentioning, that we are also concerned how farmers who, for, for whom they are producing, where they sell, and also what kind of quality they have to produce uh, in terms of agri agri business. So our finding shows that the innovation platform has huge emphasis on uh, demand articulation. Uh, we found it that one was strong. So the, they did a lot of diagnosis activities, and they have identified complex issues that farmers have been facing in terms of feed, breeding, animal health, and finance issues. And for that matter, these, these problems are very interrelated. Addressing only feed issues is not going to solve the productivity of the farmer. So uh, we will see that in the, in the later one. So the demand articulation, the other, the other thing we have noticed is not inclusive of farmer's knowledge, because mostly researchers were the one who, uh, who was uh, considered as a source of knowledge, but farmer's knowledge was not integrated in developing the technologies. The third one is institutional support. Uh, IPs, the innovation platform, was a major source of the, in, the, the, the provider of the inputs and services for the farmers. Once the innovation platform was finished or the project was completed, farmers were left over uh, with no support. So they, they, it affected the sustained use of the technologies they have adopted during the innovation platforms. The agribusiness development. Uh, so here, this one was totally was not considered when developing the technologies, especially uh, improving the farmers marketing and agribusiness skills that uh, they have to be market oriented. And when they produce and they, when they use inputs, when they invest in uh, improved feed technologies, they have to be uh, also looking at the profit making strategy so that they can reinvest and continue uh, developing that technology. So as a summary, uh, the barriers farmers are facing are both technological and institutional, but the multi-level IP was more effective in developing those technologies, uh, which are farm level technologies, but was less effective in institutional related issues like dealing how to organize farmers to have access to better access to inputs and services. So the other uh, thing that we found was power dynamics within IPs. So as I mentioned earlier that researchers are uh, resource providers who established the IPs. At the same time, they were also considered as a source of knowledge. So when, when farmers think of researchers, they think that they are the, the only source of the knowledge, uh, which gives them the legitimacy to uh, focus only on the knowledge that they have, which was uh, farm level technical issues. So this led the functioning of the IPs to be less effective. That's what we found, and uh, in, especially to integrate farmers' knowledge in the co-innovation process because most farmers are unable to sustain the technologies. Uh, the study that we conducted was two years after the innovation platform completed. So we found almost half of the farmers uh, was not able to sustain the technologies they adopted. And because of mainly lack of uh, profit from uh, like investing in those feed technologies. So farmers couldn't able to increase the productivity of milk or meat, and they couldn't able to sell to market and get income so that they can continue reinvesting in those technologies. So farmers demand access to breeding bulls, animal health and financial services was the most three important things they mentioned they are still lacking to, to be able to be productive in their uh, livestock. So we, in our thesis, in my thesis, I try to recommend uh, the whole uh, systems approach to deal with this kind of uh, uh, IP so that we can make multi-level multi innovation platforms more effective in addressing uh, not only technological, as you can see here, the innovation outcomes can be technological, organizational, or institutional, and these two didn't get that much emphasis, so they have to be part of the integral part of the development of the innovation during the design. And the process is, we may start from addressing farm level issues, like technological, for example, they focus on feed technologies, so, but also through reflexive learning, through organizing a kind of reflexive learning, evaluating it, they can address also organizational and institutional. It's a kind of uh, iterative learning process that should lead to a uh, better outcome. And the innovation can also occur across a value chain uh, from inputs and services, livestock production, uh, milk or meat, or agribusiness, like uh, processing, marketing, and retailing. So the whole value chain need to be uh, first considered and also they have to select either they are going to support breed like uh, dairy or sheep fattening or so that they can uh, target the supermarkets and uh, help farmers to gain the benefits uh, 
to sustain the technologies. This way we can uh, address, I hope, the, the climate change effect of the greenhouse gas emission from livestock if we only increase the productivity and make farmers benefit from it. And thank you. Well, I think now we've got time for questions. Um, we're actually, we, you know, we, um, we thing was meant to finish at about 11, but essentially we do have time for questions. So I encourage you to stay uh, those who do have questions. I think Yori was collecting them. Oh, just one question. Okay, so maybe the speakers is a particular speaker or on a rule. Come on, up, can you come to rule? Um, maybe the other speakers could come as well because I think Paul might have some questions for the other speakers. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'll read the question. Um, Narul, um, how do the social and ecological relationships of soil carbon management policy fit into the indigenous knowledge systems, which is our Aboriginal, many Aboriginal systems, in terms of land care in Australia? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you might have to. I think it's probably a fairly, yeah, anyway, I'll let, I'll let Narul answer that because he's mainly spoken with farmers, not uh, Indigenous landholders. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a holistic approach. So it's a whole, a whole, whole approach. I mean, the, considering mm. the social and ecological aspects. So, uh, in terms of uh, social, I'm thinking about the farmer. So in, when I'm thinking about the farmer, maybe I can think about the indigenous people in that in that context. Mm. Um, uh, 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 when if, if indigenous people is uh, considered and uh, included, mm. then uh, that could be the solution yeah. uh, in terms of land care or land management. And I'm thinking maybe what they're trying to get at is, could you repeat this with uh, indigenous, like to capture some indigenous knowledge systems in doing the same process? Like, could you use the same interview process or would you do a slightly different approach, do you think, if you were dealing with Indigenous knowledge systems? I think I, think I would do a very a slightly uh, different approach to, to, to approach them, I mean. Yeah. But uh, the, the questionnaire format and the, uh, the questionnaire structure will be similar. Mm. Because so, 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 people, so people can use my approach mm. for any aspect. Mm -hmm. But the uh, approaching would be uh, similar. I mean, uh, the different. Yeah. Okay. I think I think that's what they're trying to get at, if I understood it correctly. Yeah. Um, but of course, they can clarify if they want. Um, yeah. I think some of those a compliment for you, Har. They're a very well done, very nice example of farmers process information. So that's that's good. Did you have any? Do the other speakers? Oh, there's a question from the floor. Girl, yeah. Girl. yeah. yeah. Um, I was just, um, on, on, my background is plant so I have not had contact with plants in the past, so far. Just what, curious about what is soil um, carbon farming have there? What, what do you mean by that? I mean, not an abstract intent, what do you mean by carbon farming? Mm -hmm. Soil carbon management. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe it wasn't clear. Um, the the questioner was asking about um, a definition of what is soil carbon management, and I think I'd, I prefer not to use farming because carbon farming. Uh, if anyone's aware of the government's policy on carbon farming, it actually not necessarily specifically about soil. Sometimes it is, but carbon farming could be about capturing carbon. Uh, in, in trees. So a lot of carbon farming, as I talk about it in the media, is sometimes about uh, retaining native vegetation or uh, stopping farming, uh, sort of cropping and, and letting the regrowth happen. And, and so farms are being brought up for uh, letting the vegetation come back. But Narul's talking about soil carbon management. Uh, he might want to explain why we, we kept it in a fairly broad term like that. And do you want to, you want to understand what soil carbon management actually could be? So maybe the practices? Yeah, so maybe yeah. The, yeah, that's, the, that's the practices the farmers are doing and farmers, how farmers are understanding uh, the, what is soil carbon, so how soil carbon can be stored in their, mm. in their farmlands. So that is the soil the carbon. Soil, in the soil, yeah. yeah. In, in the, the soil, soil. Yeah, in terms of their practices. For example, farmers are thinking when they are, they are doing the regenerative agriculture, they are doing some sort of uh, incorporating some sort of uh, carbon in the soil, even though even though they don't have any evidence or I mean experimental evidences for that. Mm. 
uh, recently some of the uh, experiments showing that rotational grazing or maybe the sparsely grazing our stock management have some influence for the soil carbon I mean, soil carbon storage but uh, uh, in, in Australia and in, in my farmers case uh, most of them don't have that kind of influence but they, they think that they have other influence which is the uh, core benefit that I mentioned mm -hmm. so I, I keep it, keep it uh, fairly broad because uh, I kept it uh, soil carbon management because I want to uh, show that uh, not only the sequestering carbon in the soil but also the other benefits which this farmer looking after also in in that management system yeah so i, I maybe i'll summarize yeah. all you, but i think what we we took when selecting the farmers they were interviewed the the important fact was that they'd be had a long history of of doing a certain practice so it might be rotational grazing plan grazing there's lots of different names for these yeah. grazing management systems but we had we had quite a range we had biodynamic farming we had um, time control grazing, uh, time control grazing, strategic grazing. So they're basically trying to look at, you know, maintaining a level of cut. So one farmer put it very simply, like I just want to increase my ground cover. So increasing your ground cover or maintaining a high level of ground cover obviously will have inputs into the soil. So it's a, it's in soil carbon management. It's really biomass, um, how much you you re and then the roots are the the exudates of the roots are giving you the soil carbon. So essentially what they're trying to do is can they, through their grazing management, are they able to actually improve their soil carbon um, and what were some of the social and, and other components that were fitting into that, supporting their, their soil carbon management, pro, you know, what they were doing. And so most of these people that Narul spoke to had been doing that for say 10, 30 plus years. Yeah. Average more than 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Was another question from the floor. So I've got a question you sort of taking this carbon discussion and then mm. you're asking the car about the, the um the use folks do. Were they were they aware of the value of carbon? The so agronomic value of carbon? Uh yeah. And oh, I'm sorry. were they um did they observe carbon? Did they have um visual assessment of carbon? Did they ever talk about so is that in a rule or for? Uh, oh, okay. Ha. Do you want to come up here, Ha, so we can hear you better? So I think, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did like in our study, like uh, the farmer in. Uh, central of Vietnam, like uh, in my study area, like uh, they not mention about the uh, soil carbon or something like that. It is uh, like uh, the new term to them, mm. but the way like uh, they they focus in like uh, the the mold. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> it's like a, um, yeah, the, <laughs> to yeah, yeah. So it's more the humus, actually. Mm, probably yeah. they called it something different, but it was. Yeah, um, but, but I think like it's quite the same, like a and uh, and I think the color would have represented to yeah, them the darker. The darker. Mm -hmm. So the visual mm -hmm. soil assessment's interesting is that you take a mm -hmm. sample of the surface soil from the forest, right? Mm -hmm. And the color when you come to the color question in, in the visual soil assessment, you're actually comparing an undisturbed site that has no farming to the colour of the surface of, of their soil. And so mm -hmm. colour, which was something we, we identified early, was, was really important to the, those farmers. The, the loss of, or the change in colour to them was an indicator, well, how, how much carbon mm -hmm. do I have in my soil? Have mm -hmm. I lost soil? Erosion, obviously, is a big issue in those sort of hilly areas of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So that was something else they were very conscious of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but know. maybe not carbon, yeah. I have another question for you. Not half? Yeah, there's another and also Paul. What do you think are the most important factors in agriculture tourism can have a bit longer recovery of the region instead of pushing too much pressure on the productivity, direct productivity from soil and vegetation than have a rest. And also I think it can limit the migration from rural areas. Mm. Because so, yeah. Can you repeat, is it agricultural so in tourism? Bringing okay. productivity in rural areas, okay. maybe from cultivation and grazing, no. um, can agricultural tourism mm. replace that immediate pressure so that the nature can recover 
So like another source of income. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. an interesting question. I, I would actually say that I, I would have um, I would have paid to go up to the <laughs> hills of Vietnam and, and, and look at their farming practices. Yeah. Yeah. And also if you, if you, I know that you yeah. guys answer that one, but yeah. So that one? Yeah. 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 I think in terms of productivity, you are right. Like we're putting more pressure on the land and water and resources that we have. But when it comes to, for example, specific to smaller uh, livestock in developing countries, we have a huge number of livestock that are like uh, relying on resources, but they are giving productivity very low. So we are very inefficient in terms of our environment. And the, the suggestion that is coming is like, instead of having a number of livestock, you can have the productive uh, cow that can give like uh, milk, but at the same time, uh, you minimize the, the reliance on the environment at the same time also giving farmers to, to, to get profit out of it. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that interesting thing you mentioned is uh, the relationship between migration and also use going to urbanization. So one of the triggers is, I think, for example, in Ethiopia, the, the farming system is not becoming profitable. And people are like migrating to get some income from urban cities. So as far as we do uh, productivity and also technologies, like uh, if you use daily system and try to link farmers to supermarkets, then users will come and join the farming community to produce more foods to feed our population. That's mm. how I see it. I think. Mm. Yeah, I think um, ag agritourism is really important. It's becoming really important in Australia too, mm. uh, particularly where incomes are a bit marginal. It, it, provides a good opportunity for in income diversification, keeping people still doing the farming, keeping people in rural areas, but providing another source of income and mm. keeping city city people a, a chance to see how food is produced. Food is I, I think it's it's yeah. really important and, and really valuable. I, I don't think there's any one solution and I don't think you're in, you know, I think so agritourism, also things around local handicrafts and other ways to sort of value local, local practices, local knowledge, sort of any way to do that to, to create income diversification and you know, can contribute. Because in the Haas case, <clears throat> there's two different ethnic groups and for in one situation, the more, um, well, they weren't com more commercial, but they were probably more profitable farming systems. But the problem what they were having was that the, 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 the next generation were not interested in, in staying there. So I think the point Paul made it very early was that, you know, the, the demographics were a big influence and they're, they're influencing all developing countries, I think, in the terms of uh, retaining that, you know, the knowledge of the farming system, but also, um, you know, the labour. <laughs> It's just not as attractive for younger people. They would rather go to the big city and have a more of a, a high, better lifestyle, I think. Do you think it's starting in a regional Australia? Uh, well, so well, well you know, Nauru's farmers, most of them are in their um, 50s. Well, that's because they were experienced farmers, but I would say that the, the, there is a younger generation that of uh, some of the farmers Nauru involved were younger. Um, and I think they're more uh, interested in some of the policies that the government are doing. They're probably interested in, in engaging in those policies. Um, but yeah, we, we are looking at an aging farming population uh, with less younger farm, you know, yeah. I mean, it's not as aging as Americans. <laughs> some interesting data pretty uh, yeah, old. came out last year about the loss of languages um, globally. It's, we talk about loss of biodiversity, we're losing cultural diversity as well. Um, small languages are dis disappearing, so the, as older people you know, move on, the languages are disappearing, young people not learning them. It's, it's definitely happening in Indigenous communities in Australia and globally. So there's a, uh, you know, I'd almost use the word crisis, but it's deeply concerning that we're losing that cultural diversity and that young people. So as we sort of the McDonaldsization of, of the world is, is sort of a, a threat to cultural diversity. And so anything like agritourism and um, um, valorising or put it, you know, seeing value in Indigenous things is, is important. But I guess there's a limit to, you know, young people just are walking out the door. <laughs> To the city, so. and also the context is different. Like in developing countries, we are under producing, and in Africa, if you put like the export of foods, like wheat, for example, is increasing dramatically. But this is despite the natural resources and the potential we have to produce and export. 
So it's like a growing population there and uh, producing peanut foods, uh, as well as also, uh, yeah, keeping farming community to really go to to secure our food needs, food uh, food systems. Uh, from that perspective, I think we need more youngs and more productivity uh, that we need to reach to produce. Okay. Guys, I think I've got one last question from the from the. Um, up in there, Zoom. I, I mean, I have answered this, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, what What would be some incentives to provide to that could boost farming as a private business? I feel that most people who give give up farming give up because it doesn't pay off enough to be worth the time. Do, do you, does anyone want to respond to that? Do you think that's the case? Are they give up farming, or is it? Depends, I suppose, on the farming system if it's a subsistence versus commercial. But um, do you think if they made more money, they'd stay on farming? Is I think that's the point they're making. More incentives, yes. So, what sort of incentives do you think? I think, in in, in terms of uh, perspectives of small order farmers in developing countries, uh, they need more incentives to stay in the farm, and uh, the they are, for example, if you take the Eastern Africa migration to Asia and no to uh, to Arabia Arab Arab countries. One of the the hype migration route and the youth who are coming are from rural areas and they come to Addis, for example, the capital cities and they found difficult to get job and though they migrate to Europe and others. So the main triggers for Ethiopian farmers, for example, the young are not getting enough and our land is, for example. Uh, uh, farm, farming si farm size is maybe two, one hectare per average household. So the population of Africa is increasing, increasing as you know. And then, so the land is getting like shrinking and shrinking and farm, farming is becoming more difficult to keep five, six, seven family members uh, in the farm. So uh, I think more incentives, more productivity, if, if that is managed and increased, even if we reach to the potential of where we should produce, that will maintain or have a greater impact on migration as well. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to respond to that? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, incentives. I, I see a lot of innovation. Sometimes I think that farmers are actually, you know, several steps ahead of government and several steps ahead of NGOs. And um, they're, they're working at their own problems and, and or coming up with solutions to their own problems. So innovating. I know policies might say in this area, you've got to grow these crops and farmers ignore that and grow something that's profitable. So I think to some extent, and I guess coming from a free market approach, you, you know, you try to not have too many incentives, but just let people innovate and support innovation. That's probably sort of one thing because incentives is maybe just you sort of you take the money or take the incentive, but not not really change. So I think uh, yeah. that's- Can, can I give an example, maybe? Uh, it's related to the rules yes. because yes. some of the carbon policy is actually quite, would, back, would be an incentive for someone to degrade their land because the soil carbon, for instance, is only based on how much you uh, add. And so it's, you have to do an order at the start and then uh, on audit later on. And, and of course, for most farmers who've already been practicing soil carbon management and improving their soils over 10 deca you know, decades, there's no additionality. They're not likely to get a big increase in soil carbon. So for them, there's no incentive to actually be part of that soil carbon policy because they've probably got as much carbon as they can get at the moment. And the only the only incentive would be to, to degrade your land <laughs> to make sure it actually has a uh, little carbon as possible and go back and then build it back up again. So they're, they're, you know, the science and the policy need to, and also just the understanding of farmers' uh, motivations and, and interests need to be aligned a lot better to actually make sense, I think, and actually recognise a, a different narrative potentially than the one they're pushing. Thank you. I think he mentioned as well um, that in some cases um, the um, um, carbon initiatives, uh, carbon farming initiative had negative impact on soil yeah. carbon. I think he. Yeah. I can explain that. Well, basically, there's there's no farmers taking up, or very few farmers taking up soil carbon credits. But Nurul might want to explain yeah. what he meant by the negative yeah. impact. 
So actually, I was talking about the uh, loop. I mean, uh, the feedback loops um, because uh, I identified ten critical feedback loops in my study. But when considering the policy, most of the time policy is considering one or two feedback loops. For example, uh, uh, when uh, farmers are taking the soil carbon management uh, program in their farm, they can uh, have a good income after a reasonable period of time. But in that case, there may be, uh, uh, they have to increase their cattle, number of cattle. So they're more grazing. So it can, uh, I mean, reverse the source, I mean, sink into a source of emission. So that is the case. So in that case, the opposite, uh, I mean, the solution would be to adopt the uh, sustainable management practice. I mean, some sustainable land management practice like uh, rotational grazing or the sparsely grazing things. So, uh, so there's no chance to consider only one or two loops. So you have to consider the whole social ecological system if you want to get the realistic output. Otherwise, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, I just looked at the time, but I, I think it's been a really good discussion. I really thank you for coming here today uh, and also all the people that joined us uh, online. I just sort of the map. Uh, joined online. It's great. And thank you all our speakers, Lalam Ha, Paul and Narul for coming today. And also thanks to the RAID Network for making this possible. Uh, it's just wonderful to see all the, all the people we um, have here today. So thanks, everyone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think it's this uh, this one. Uh...